Okay, the first talk of the last sub-session of the last session of the last day of the conference is given by uh, Victor uh, Kasatkin, identifying uh, phase transition with and without quantum annealers. You have 20 minutes. Let's talk about phase transitions. Consider uh, this Hamiltonian, it's called frustrated ladder Hamiltonian. The uh, bottom row and the vertical lines are uh, the qubits uh, coupled ferromagnetically and the top row coupled antiferromagnetically. Also the top row is biased towards spin up and the bottom row is uh, slightly biased towards spin down. Uh, uh, the, what I described was classical part of the Hamiltonian, and we also have the parameter S, which uh, interpolates between the uh, standard uh, transverse field Hamiltonian and this classical Hamiltonian. How do we find phase transitions of that uh, Hamiltonian? Well, people uh, already know for that particular Hamiltonian that uh, there are a couple of order parameters. Uh, which are called staggered magnetization of the top row and magnetization of the bottom row. And we can compute those parameters for various uh, values uh, of the parameters of the Hamiltonian, S, K, and U, and draw these uh, phase diagrams. On the horizontal axis is uh, U, K is equal to one, and on the vertical axis is S, and the temperature is zero. So we are looking at uh, the uh, order parameters for the ground state. And uh, here the chain length is equal to 10. Uh, and I talked about phase transitions. So you may know that phase transitions are defined in thermodynamic limit, uh, which means that you cannot see actually phase transitions uh, here, although you can see something which looks very closely like phase transitions. The places where uh, the color on this graph changes quickly. So this is problem number one, right? Uh, how do we def even define this task uh, given that we are dealing with finite systems? And throughout this talk we will be dealing with uh, finite systems, and in particular this system as an example throughout the talk. The second challenge is that uh, we would like to find phase transitions where they are not known yet. And in particular, we don't know the relevant order parameters. Uh, uh, how do we even define phase transitions if we don't know uh, what order parameters we should look at? So that would be the second problem, which I will also address later. But first, let me describe the uh, challenge, which we will be uh, uh, trying to solve throughout this talk. The challenge is between uh, classical algorithms or classical machines and uh, machines which have uh, access to a quantum computer. And throughout this talk, this quantum computer would be uh, the quantum annealer. Moreover, throughout this talk, the, we will consider one single framework for solving this problem using quantum annealer which is we first use quantum annealer to generate a data set of bit strings, and then you ma use machine learning to learn phase transitions from those bit strings. Although in principle we uh, could ask uh, machine learning to provide uh, uh, additional requests to quantum annealers, but we will not be doing this uh, in this talk. And here lies the third problem which is uh, the machine learning algorithm uh, will only have access to the bit strings, and bit strings provide incomplete information of the quantum state in general. So uh, let me now address uh, all of these uh, problems. And the way people address this is with a quantity called fidelity susceptibility. The, this is the quantity which intuitively uh, measures uh, a square rate of change of the underlying state. Uh, uh, these are the definitions on the top row is the definition of F, which is the fidelity for pure state or for mixed state. Um, and then there is Fc, which is classical fidelity. 
which is what we can measure if we can only access uh, probability distributions over bit strings. And then uh, the fidelity susceptibility is uh, the uh, first non-trivial term in the Taylor expansion of uh, this fidelity, given uh, that the state changes depending on some parameter s. There are, uh, uh, so we know that uh, uh, quantum phase transitions or phase transitions in general are characterized by uh, changes um, in uh, fidelity or uh, more specifically by maxima of the fidelity susceptibility. Typically for the first order phase transition you will see uh, fidelity susceptibility uh, diverge to infinity and for the second order phase transition you will see sharp maxima of the fidelity susceptibility. But uh, importantly, uh, we know that classical fidelity susceptibility in many cases tracks the fidelity susceptibility closely. In particular, if the Hamiltonian is uh, real valued in the computational basis, and we are looking at the ground state of that Hamiltonian, which is non-degenerate, then almost always the fidelity susceptibility will be equal to the classical fidelity susceptibility. And in general, there is the observation that uh, on average across uh, all measurements in which you can, uh, all bases in which you could perform the measurement, classical fidelity susceptibility is half of the full fidelity susceptibility if you are measuring pure state. For mixed states, things get more complicated. But uh, there is still some hope that our quantum robot, uh, which uh, only processes bit strings, will still be able to uh, solve the problem of identifying phase transitions. Let's talk about what our classical robot could do to solve this problem. And one approach, which was actually used for the phase diagram uh, I displayed above, is called Lanchos, also known as exact diagonalization. And uh, this approach uh, is able to find uh, a few low energy states. Unfortunately, its complexity scales uh, exponentially, uh, as you can see here, with the size of the system. There is two to them uh, here. So in practice, that means that uh, we could run it for 20 qubits on a laptop in an hour or in two hours, but if uh, the system uh, becomes larger than 30 qubits, it's usually impractical to run it. And for 50 plus qubits, it's impossible to run it. Um, other methods uh, are uh, tensor network based methods, for example, DMRG, uh, which works reasonably well in one dimension for systems uh, except when there is a large long range entanglement. And its complexity is polynomial, but uh, first uh, it's very challenging to apply it to the systems which are different from uh, 1D unless you want to pay exponential price. Uh, and uh, it breaks down if uh, there is a large long range entanglement. Another method is uh, called uh, QMC or SQA, which uh, can be used to sample the bit strings and then uh, as in the quantum robot, uh, we could apply some machine learning to learn the phase transition from those uh, bit strings. Uh, this method works reasonably well uh, unless there is a sign problem or topological abstractions. But when there is a sign problem or topological abstractions, then uh, it breaks down. And there are some other methods like you could do perturbative expansion if your Hamiltonian is similar to something which is uh, well known for which the uh, eigenstates are well known or you can extrapolate from other system sizes or particularly, uh, or even from other systems, other Hamiltonians. In particular, you could uh, explore some complex extrapolation schemes using machine learning. But in general, it's very hard to solve this problem for complex uh, systems in more than one dimension. The system is large enough. 
Let's now uh, go back to our uh, quantum robot. And as you can see, there are two parts. So first is we sample bit strings from uh, quantum annealer. Uh, how do we do this? Well, uh, a naive idea is uh, to anneal till a specific uh, values of the parameters and then measure uh, those bit strings. Unfortunately, uh, the annealer we had access to, which is a uh, wave advantage device, doesn't allow to measure in the middle of the anneal, and that's what we are interested in. So, uh, as you can see, the diagrams uh, we get from the annealer uh, here, uh, and here uh, have these vertical lines, which means that uh, not much changes as we change S. Uh, in fact, it looks like we are always measuring at the end of the annual, which we are. We're just uh, doing quench as fast as possible till the, the end of the annual, and as fast as possible is not fast enough. So unfortunately, so far, uh, we are not able to sample uh, bit strings from quantum annealer with adequate uh, mm, uh, quality. Although Andrew had uh, uh, some ideas, we, Andrew King uh, had some ideas which we could explore further. But it looks like uh, for this project, we are looking to demonstrate that we could apply these algorithms to some future quantum annealers where those problems will be resolved. Now let's look at the second step, which is machine learning. So we have the bit strings. We want to get the phase transition. This is not a new uh, topic. Uh, there is uh, some literature on that. In particular, uh, there are uh, these two papers. First is uh, machine learning phases of matter, and the second uh, is learning phase transitions by confusion. So in the first one, uh, mainly uh, people uh, looked at uh, uh, identifying order parameters, so something like order parameters, if phase transition, if the location of phase transition is already known. Uh, or um, identifying phase transitions if we could identify it just by uh, learning whether the state looks like zero temperature state or infinite temperature state. Or in our case, we could apply it by looking at whether a state looks like state at s equals zero or state at s equal one. Um, unfortunately, even for that uh, diagram above, uh, at the phase transition, the state already uh, looks uh, far away from state at s equals zero. Uh, so that is not expected to work even for that uh, for example. Uh, another method uh, is learning phase transition by confusion. And in essence, uh, it also uh, won't work uh, in uh, general for our case because um, it, uh, so, so first, it requires a training of one network per potential critical value. So it would be quite expensive to do. And also, uh, they rely on some uh, pre-computed uh, features. And we are learning uh, the phase transitions from bit strings. And also, they're not actually um, uh, learning the fidelity susceptibility or anything quantitatively close to fidelity susceptibility. They suggest to identify phase transitions from graphs like this, where this dot in the middle um, uh, indicates the phase transition, which may be uh, not robust enough. So we propose the method which we call bit string IFC, and uh, it describes uh, like uh, on this diagram, first we convert the initial data set we get of the bit strings and the corresponding uh, parameters of a Hamiltonian to a specifically crafted binary classification problem, which aims at uh, uh, distinguishing uh, states at different values of the parameters. Then we need some machine learning model which could solve that binary classification problem. And if we could do this, then from that machine learning model, we could extract estimates of the fidelity susceptibility. That's the idea in general, and uh, I won't have time to describe it in more details in uh, this talk. So after we got uh, estimates of the fidelity susceptibility, classical fidelity susceptibility, we then find the maximum of that uh, classical fidelity susceptibility, and those will be our estimates of the locations of the phase transition. So let's see how well it performs. 
this is again an uh, example from the approximated ladder model here k is equal to u equal to 1 l is again 10 and uh, the black line here is uh, the true fidelity suitability extracted from Lanchas. It's pretty good. Uh, uh, and the blue line is uh, our estimate. As you can see, it's not perfect. But uh, the maximum of that fidelity susceptibility is quite close to the maximum of the true fidelity susceptibility. And let's, uh, so this is a second order phase transition. Let's look at another example, which is uh, the same frustrated uh, ladder, but with u equal to 0 0.2. And again, uh, you can see that uh, we got both of the peaks of the fidelity susceptibility uh, quite closely. Uh, that's all for the talks. Uh, while uh, you think about the questions, let me uh, summarize. So uh, we looked at what classical algorithms could do. They could solve uh, problems up to size 20 in most of the cases. But for larger sizes, if the problem is uh, complex and it's hard to extrapolate from uh, known solutions, uh, generally classical algorithms uh, fail. And in a uh, uh, quantum case, we were able to demonstrate an algorithm, machine learning algorithm, which uh, could identify the phase transitions from these strings. But right now, with the current quantum annealers, uh, there is a challenge with the first step, which we hope will be resolved uh, in the future with better quantum annealers. Questions? Maybe better to wait for microphone. Otherwise, I will have to repeat the yeah, question. Yeah, people online listen to you. Yeah, thank you. That was a very interesting talk. Um, could you please again go back? I think to the first plot of the susceptibility that you showed. First part of. Uh, no, no, I mean the the um, uh, trained model predictions and the Lankosh uh, comparison. Towards the end, like the performance of the model towards uh, that one. Yeah. Uh, Eric was. Uh, uh, oh, that's a 20 qubit system. Okay. Okay. I know, then actually my question uh, resolved itself. Thank you. <laughs> Am I right that you, you, you use the bit strings for the, um, for the quantum annealer method coming from the classical computations because you couldn't get the one, ones right. from. So okay. here, bit strings are sampled uh, using clanchers, but uh, the idea is that we could use the same algorithm with yeah. uh, bit strings. An annealer that gives you the bit strings, you could use those. That's the point. Right. Once we have the annealer which could sample those bit strings, yes. Just very philosophical question. What kind of phase transitions uh, between kind between what kind of different phases you could predict the phase transition? Should be it like Landau paradigm of you have to have some order parameter and spontaneous symmetry breaking, or you can do more, predict MBL transition or some kind of transition between different symmetry protected topological phases, yeah, where there is no other parameter. So how general the method is? Well, the method is quite general in the sense that it doesn't need any access to any kind of order parameter. It predicts the fidelity susceptibility. Uh, if the pattern, uh, which uh, is from the bit strings uh, to identify uh, on which side of the phase transitions are they is very complex, which machine learning cannot learn, then this method will uh, fail. But in all cases we tried so far, machine learning was pretty successful in learning uh, the uh, task, uh, like uh, th this task. 
uh, here uh, from the bit strings. Does that answer your question? I think the, maybe the question was more of the sense, uh, does the susceptibility is able to capture topological phase transitions on top of, uh, of uh, typical and Ginsburg? That well, the fidelity susceptibility uh, generally measures the rate of a change of the underlying state. So regardless of the nature of that change, fidelity susceptibility itself uh, is expected to capture all uh, phase transitions. So there are two questions now. First, uh, does that translate to classical fidelity susceptibility? Of course, if you have a phase transition which doesn't reflect itself in the distribution of the bit strings, then uh, the answer would be no. But that's pretty rare as uh, demonstrated by the properties of the classical fidelity susceptibility. That's expected to be pretty rare. And the second question is if the pattern itself in the bit strings, maybe it exists, uh, maybe there is a difference between probability distributions, but you cannot describe it uh, in a short amount of space, or a machine learning model cannot learn it. Then this method will also fail. But we didn't find any example where it would fail. Well, we didn't try it, so uh, maybe that's a good suggestion for me to try. We can discuss it after. We can definitely discuss this after the talks because I'm also interested. Any other question? Okay, if not, then let's thank Mr. again.